you could be in some of these action movies for being a superhero because you do it all, John Kamara Parker. You do solo recitals. You go to Siberia and perform concerts. You do television shows. You do workshops. You do duos. You just are amazing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm busy for sure. I don't know about amazing, but thank you. I'm also playing part-time in a sort of rock group with the great iconic police drummer, Stuart Copeland. That's a really, really fun extra thing that I do. I, for the last two years, have been the artistic director of the Honan's International Piano Competition, which takes place every three years in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's an extraordinary competition, one of the most important ones in the world for pianists. And in our last competition, we had 10 semifinalists that we'd invited to play after judging a video round, representing nine different countries. So that was incredibly exciting, and that's part of what I do. And most recently, I have just joined forces very nearby with the Minnesota Orchestra as their creative partner for summer programming. And I was actually in Minneapolis a couple of days ago working with the administration and meeting with the board and talking about programming for the summer season. And then on the side, you teach at Rice, and then you also concertize around the world. How do you manage to do all of this? Well, it's a kind of a mileage thing, but I've done some really dumb things. Like two days ago, I was in Minneapolis in meetings, and that had been scheduled a little bit at the last minute, and then I flew that afternoon back to Houston so that I could teach my class at Rice and then actually the next morning flew to Des Moines to rehearse with the orchestra so that made no sense at all because it was only later when I looked at a map and I realized how close Minneapolis and Des Moines are and that Houston is not like an intermediate stop normally but sometimes you just have to do those kinds of things. I'm incredibly excited about being here. I've never been to Iowa, and I've always wanted to see it. And part of my trip here includes a drive to Decorah, which is perfect because I get to stop in Spillville and pay homage to Dvorak. So this is great. Well, that's fantastic that you're going to do that. So give us just a bit of background about how you got into what you're doing right now. I grew up in a very musical family in Canada. I'm Canadian, originally from Vancouver. And I took to the piano just so naturally. Apparently, when I was three, there was a radio program that my parents listened to every day. And I went up to the piano, and I picked out the tune with one finger on the piano. And so it was recognizable enough that they realized, oh, that's our radio show. So I started taking piano lessons, and I just never looked back. I remember in first grade when the teacher asked us all, what do you want to be when you grow up? And all the girls said ballerina or something, and all the guys said fireman or hockey star. And I says, well, I'm going to be a pianist. And I mean, I really knew. I was devoted to it from the beginning. But my musical inspirations have come from a lot of different sources. The great concert pianist Arthur Rubinstein was one of my big heroes when I was growing up. But then when I was a teenager, my biggest hero as a pianist was Elton John. And I listened to all of his music. I just was counting down the days for his next album to come out. And this was in the 70s in his first big career. You know, he's had so many. And then later on when I was in college and I went to Juilliard in New York and I discovered Oscar Peterson, like the greatest jazz pianist who ever lived, in my opinion, and a fellow Canadian, which I kind of liked. And actually, I got to meet all of my heroes. I met Arthur Rubinstein once, I met Elton John once, and I met Oscar Peterson several times. But they all shared one very important thing, which made it not matter that one was a classical pianist and one was a rock and roll pianist and one was a jazz pianist, was they had this incredible joy in performing. And I try to channel that when I'm on stage, because I truly love to make music. But more than that, I want everyone in the audience to love it as much as I am. Well, you have performed with such jazz greats, Benny Green and Bill Sharlap, as well as Doc Severinsen and Bobby McFerrin. It's really an amazing well, list. I have to underline that I'm not a jazz pianist, and I completely bow down to all of them, and they're just astounding abilities and virtuosity. And it was in an Oscar Peterson tribute concert that I met some of those pianists. And in the case of Bobby McFerrin, he was conducting me in a Gershwin concerto with the Baltimore Symphony. And that's all I thought I was going to do. And it ended up 
that the orchestra, incorrectly believing that I was a true jazz pianist, had actually scheduled Bobby McFerrin and me to be on stage together for 20 minutes of improv, which I didn't find out until the day of the concert. And so massive panic ensued. But Bobby McFerrin is the kind of guy who could make the most tone-deaf person on the street do something musical. I mean, he is an incredibly engaging and inspiring force. And we worked out how we would put together a 20-minute program and it really worked, and it really clicked, and he made sure that we were improvising in ways that were comfortable for me, for the most part. You know, I was definitely stepping outside of my box a little bit, but it was an incredibly exciting experience. And you also performed in Sarajevo, which led to a 50th anniversary commemoration where you were a featured speaker. Yeah, it was for an organization called AmeriCares, and AmeriCares is an organization that puts the vast majority of its resources into instantly providing relief into countries that need it. That includes the United States. They have done a lot of work in the States as well, but they've addressed poverty and war-torn areas of the world for many years, and they had planned a trip to Sarajevo. It was their 36th trip to Sarajevo, but it was in New Year's Eve of 1995, which was right after the Dayton Peace Treaty had been signed, and there was a kind of tentative peace in Sarajevo, and the Sarajevo Philharmonic announced that they would give a concert. Bono was there to announce that U2 was going to come and give a concert, and the president of AmeriCares called the Sarajevo Symphony and said, you know, we're doing an airlift, we're bringing in food, medicine, clothing. We'd like, as a symbolic gesture, to bring in a soloist for your concert. And then they contacted me and basically recruited me to do this crazy thing. And I've never flown on an airplane with, you know, webbed seating and a cargo plane and all this kind of quasi-military stuff. And I was totally unprepared for any of it and flying into Sarajevo wearing flak jackets and all of that. It was experiencing really a very recent ceasefire. And it was incredibly exciting to be there because of the purpose of the concert, which was to celebrate peace, to have violinists sharing music stands who, because of their backgrounds, were supposed to be at war with each other but never had any war with each other personally. And what happened at the end of that concert I played the Beethoven Emperor Piano Concerto, and after the performance, and this is New Year's Eve in a very cold Sarajevo in a concert hall that had been damaged in the war but not destroyed, and a very old Bosnian woman came backstage and found our translator and said to me, she said, I just want you to know that for about two or three minutes worth of the slow movement of the Beethoven Concerto, I suddenly realized that for the first time, I wasn't thinking about the war. And I thought, that's why I'm a musician. That's quite a story. Well, on a different note, tell us about all these things that you are hosting. You do whole notes, you do up and coming and concerto chat. Everything that I've done in a sort of media sense has really been about showcasing what I love about classical music, and also encouraging support for young musicians. When I did the radio program Up and Coming, that was very much showcasing, specifically in Canada, showcasing the tremendous young musicians there, one of whom was a 15-year-old Yuja Wong, who's now become a superstar. And it was a very exciting project to do that. The Concerto Chat videos are on my website, and you can actually go to pianoconcerto.com, and you'll come across them. And the whole idea with that was to talk about, because I love the piano concerto repertoire so much, and I'm a specialist in it and play it very often, to talk about each one maybe with an anecdote, maybe showing something interesting about the piece, something behind the scenes that a casual listener might not be aware of that might make it more interesting to listen to. And I did one for the Grieg Piano Concerto, which is my performance piece with the Des Moines Symphony. And there's lots to talk about in that piece. I mean, for example, I would call it certainly the greatest piano concerto to come out of any Scandinavian country. And it feels like music from the north. And I think that your local listeners will get that. <laughs> but it is a romantic work filled with beautiful harmonies, 
certain use of harmonies that we actually can listen to it and say, you know, that sounds Norwegian. I'm not quite sure why, <laughs> but I can see the fjords, you know, and that was Grieg's gift to create that kind of picture with his music. And of course, the Grieg is an unbelievably exciting work. I mean, it starts with this timpani roll and immediately the piano comes crashing in with this big introduction. There's a beautiful theme and it develops from there. One of the trademarks of the concerto in all three movements is that a relatively slow lyrical theme is eventually blown up into a big fortissimo statement later in that movement. And he literally does that in all three movements with great effect. And that was a special skill that some composers, Grieg had, Liszt had, where you could find a melody that would work as a very slow lyrical melody and would also work as a big, grand statement. And Grieg managed to do it in all three movements, and particularly in the first movement cadenza, which is that moment where the orchestra stops and the piano develops all the themes as a solo and it's unbelievably hair-raisingly exciting and the second movement of the concerto is kind of like a Chopin nocturne I mean it starts almost like a hymn in the orchestra I mean it feels like you could be praying and then the piano comes in with this very nocturne like music and it develops from there but it's again it's very special music and that goes directly into the finale where I always feel like I've just been shot out of a cannon and the finale is based on a Norwegian dance and so there's really a sense of dance and excitement. But even there, everything slows down, and then he saves the most beautiful tune of the entire concerto for the middle of the last movement. And you first hear it in the flute, and then you hear it in the piano, and it's just breathtakingly beautiful. So, you know, for me, the Grieg Piano Concerto is a work that I learned when I was a teenager. I first played it with the Vancouver Symphony, my hometown orchestra, when I was 19. And it was the first concerto I played with any major American orchestra, which was with the Boston Pops when I was 20. So I've been playing this piece for almost 40 years, which is suddenly a really scary thought. But I, you know, this is music I love. I'll never, ever get tired of it. And Grieg was a master. He wrote a lot of great orchestral music. He wrote three fabulous violin sonatas. He wrote all sorts of beautiful short character pieces for piano. And his music is not played, I think, quite as often as it should be. The Piano Concerto was one of those works, you know, like Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata that became so popular that it became like almost out of vogue to play it. And I would never have thought of learning the Moonlight Sonata when I was a you know, serious student at Juilliard. It was like, no, no, that's a popular piece, you know. <laughs> you don't do that. And then, of course, when I eventually learned the Moonlight Sonata, I was like, wow, this is a total masterpiece. You know? <laughs> and so was the Grieg Piano Concerto. List championed that work as well. Yeah. In fact, the great Franz Liszt, who, of course, in his day was equally famous as a virtuoso performing pianist as he was as a composer, Liszt famously sight-read the piece in front of Grieg. And Grieg's written report afterwards was that he played it flawlessly, and it was just like impossible that anybody could play it so well, you know, seeing it for the first time. But there's this fantastic chord for anybody who's technically interested. It's a G major seventh chord in third inversion, but <laughs> nobody really wants to know that. But it is a very surprising chord, and it comes right near the end of the concerto. And apparently, when Liszt was reading through the piece, he got to that chord and he stopped and he looked at Grieg and says, oh, this is genius, you know, and, and then kept playing, you know, because it was really an unexpected moment. And many of my favorite moments in music, as much as I love rhythm and melody, many of my favorite moments in music, including, you know, Beethoven Ninth Symphony and Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here album are moments where there's suddenly a shocking change of harmony. And that's one of those moments that happens in the Grieg. And I'll tell you, the orchestra sounds so good. Joe Junta is kind of a legendary figure for the number of years he's committed to this orchestra. And I know some players in the orchestra. Two of the principal wind players are recent graduates from Rice University and studied down the hall with my colleagues. So it's exciting for me to come and play with an orchestra that I've never worked with before and have a couple of connections with the players. And they're playing absolutely beautifully. So it's been a tremendous experience all around. Thank you so much for doing this today, and it's obvious that the Canadians are very lucky to have you in their camp, and thank you for all you're doing for music and promoting music all across the globe. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thanks very much. Thank you.